is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Trickster Drift, book two in the Trickster Trilogy, brought to you by Robin. In these first five chapters, I get teased a little bit thinking that things might start to improve for Jared. He's certainly making the effort. It's genuinely not his fault. But it was a tease, indeed. Because, spoiler alert, things do not start to go better for Jared. (sighs) I feel so bad for this kid. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So, um, first of all, I want to mention, and this is my fault, um, Robin commissioned this book uh, a couple of weeks ago. And when she commissioned it, I should have remembered that the last book by the same author, Eden Robinson, was not available on Kindle. Um but I completely forgot and I'm so used to just being able to download the book the night before and get reading that I waited until the last second and once again it was not available on Kindle. And last time I posted in the group on Facebook saying that I needed a copy if anybody had one and I was able to get hooked up pretty quickly by a couple people who had copies um, Moby dot Moby copies that I could read them on my Kindle. And that was awesome. But unfortunately this time around, I did not have that kind of luck. Um, so it is available on audiobook. And while I really enjoy listening to audiobooks, it can be really tricky. It's one thing if I'm doing the book club with an audiobook, because for the book club, I'm talking about a whole book at once when I'm doing the book club episodes. And I don't often feel the need to directly quote from the book unless I'm finding, um, like it's oftentimes if there is something that I want to quote, it's something that is highly quoted from the book and can be found online. If I'm doing a spoil me, I am wanting to quote as I go along because I'm covering the book at a much slower pace and there are lots of details that I want to talk about. So I used the audiobook for this episode, but I ordered also a, a print copy and we'll be waiting for that so that I can actually quote the book properly. Um, so I just want to give you guys all a heads up that if I uh, am unable to quote things completely correctly this time around, that that's what it is. I'm doing it from memory. So take that for what it is. Um, but my apologies to Robin for not being prepared. I should have remembered for whatever reason, this author, like she sell, she sells hardcover and paperback and audible via Amazon, but she doesn't sell a Kindle version. And I'm really curious why that is. Um, maybe she wasn't offered enough for it or who knows. Anyway, so what happens in this section is quite a surprise. The last book I was asking, um, I think more towards the beginning of the uh, coverage, I was sort of theorizing on whether or not it was an option for Jared to even go to college. If he saw that as part of his future, if he didn't even consider it, if it was something that was a possibility, but he was not interested in, or maybe he was very interested in, I couldn't quite tell. And it looks like he somehow managed to get early graduation from his school and is going to be enrolling early. And uh, his, his one buddy that remains, um, the nerd who is obsessed with all of the sci-fi stuff, is a little bit bummed out because he's like, dude, if you just waited and stayed and finished school with everybody, 
we could room together and we could go to school together and it would be totally fine. And why are you making, why are you taking this route, which is a lot less convenient? And it's hard for Jared to get it across to him because it seems like, so, so Crash Pad, while he is made fun of and teased and bullied, he has a pretty stable family life. And he's got, I mean, he has a dedicated bedroom filled with memorabilia from all of this stuff that he loves. He's clearly in a pretty privileged situation in comparison to Jared. And the way that Jared gets irritated with Crash Pad because what, Crash Pad, where Jared's heading is heading up to Vancouver. And for those of you who don't know, a ton of shows are filmed in Vancouver. A ton. Um, I guess it's a combination of like the um, taxes. You get like a break if you film there. Also, there's like really um, pretty dramatic forests and things that are really good for like, I think the X-Files was filmed up there as well. Like if you need forest scenes or wilderness scenes, um, and especially a lot of stuff that deals with the supernatural, I think literally he talks about supernatural, actually that show being filmed there. It's a pretty popular spot. And at one point crash pad is trying to talk him into going to visit the filming area for a certain show and get a uh, autograph from one of the hot women who's on the show. And while Jared is really pretty patient with Crash Pad most of the time and seems to genuinely like the kid, when Crash Pad starts pressing him on this, Jared gets pretty irritated because Crash Pad clearly does not understand that Jared's going up there without really any idea where he's going to stay. He has a plan to stay with Death Threat, but it's it seems to me, as much as he keeps assuring himself that's happening, that Jared has a sixth sense that it's not happening. I feel like he just, he has a vibe, you know, that he's just like, yeah, I don't actually know. But he can't say that to himself because if he doesn't have anywhere to stay, then he's just going up there blind. And that can't be the only alternative. So he has to tell himself that it's going to work out because Crash Pad, if he really understood how tenuous the housing situation is for Jared, would understand even less why Jared is insisting on going right now. And Jared can't quite get it across to him adequately. I need to get out of here because I am in a bad place with my mom. Because Crash Pad doesn't quite get how bad it is. And I don't think Jared wants to talk to him about that. As much as Crash Pad is like his only friend at this point. I don't know how many of you have come from like a tough situation at home. And are friends with somebody that you otherwise really like and trust and get along with. But you know they are not going to understand, not really, your situation. And so you decide not to share it. I have had this with a couple different people in my life. It was a sort of a weird thing because... I grew, the people that I grew up around all came from like upper middle class nuclear families. And I was like lower middle class, if that, living with a like technically still married parents who were as good as separated, who did not want to be around each other, who worked opposing shifts so as to be able to more effectively avoid one another. Um, and it really felt a lot of the time like, you know, I'm, it wasn't that I was like being abused or anything. It wasn't like my parents were having screaming matches most of the time, but there was a danger there with them 
that my friends didn't really understand. And we had less money than pretty much everybody I knew. And so it would be, it was really difficult. Whenever I would sort of bring up my parents fighting, people would, you know, my friends, well-intentioned as they were, were just like, well, why don't they just split up? And it's like, if people don't have the money to split up and live alone, they can't, you know, like you can, tr you, it, it's just a lot harder. And the, uh, it's been studied and proven that people are staying in bad, toxic, abusive marriages longer, or even just relationships with cohabitation longer, because the economy is so bad. And housing prices are so high that folks aren't feeling free to leave and and set out on their own the way they were able to for a while. So Jared has to keep a lot of this to himself because his friend is well-meaning and cares about Jared, I think. But he just doesn't – he's not in a position to really understand where Jared's coming from on this. And that's tough, you know. It's it's worse in a lot of ways when you know that somebody means well and just isn't going to understand because it's not their fault and it's not your fault. There's nobody to blame for it. And I find not having anybody to blame for a shitty situation to be incredibly frustrating. I love laying blame. I love it. It's so easy and nice and just really reassures you that you have some sort of control over the situation. And that's rarely true. <laughs> It really is an illusion. So Jared is like talking to his mom about leaving and she's making him dinner. She's making uh, spaghetti and meatballs and is really like letting him know every step of the way how much she resents having to make dinner for him. But then she gets like mad at the fact that he is uh, insinuating that she doesn't really care about him. And he says something like, because she's like, what do you think? I don't love you. And he's like, that's not it. And I think it's her that says, do you think I don't care? And he says something like, I think I'm pretty damn low on your priorities list. And she gets really irritated and tells him that she talked to her sister and that he can stay with her sister. And he's shocked by this. A little bit because he is aware for his mother to get in touch with her sister is a pretty big deal. Like the reason that she, that his mother wound up getting married to his father at all is because her sister was threatening to try and take away Jared before he was born because she wasn't going to be a fit mother and wasn't going to be able to provide him like a stable environment. So she married his dad in order to create a family unit that would look more stable. I have a lot of questions about that specifically, because taking a child away from a single mother isn't exactly the norm. Just taking her child away simply because she's single. And I'm not sure what the deal is in British Columbia with that. And I know in the United States, ch children being taken away from indigenous parents is a lot easier than it is for any other type of parent. Like indigenous parents, I think I've talked about this on another episode, but it's, it, it's been specifically subsidized in like South Dakota that for every indigenous kid in the system, in the foster system, they get, a bonus uh, towards like the state budget. So it's a literally incentivized program to take kids away. And I wonder if that's what she was experiencing. But if it were, those kids go into foster care. They don't get taken by another relative who is indigenous also. The whole point is to force them out of the native population assimilate them with white families, even if they have family that is available, they're often overlooked in favor of white families who are not related to the child at all. So I'm really curious about how exactly this went down. Um, but nevertheless, she felt that that was what was necessary and she got to keep Jared. So maybe that's why it worked. 
And the fact that she called up her sister and asked if she, if Jared could stay with her is a pretty big sacrifice of pride on her part. And she feels like that should be enough for Jared to trust her when she says that she cares about him as much as she does. But it's pretty clear that Jared's sort of like, as much as he is impressed with this, he's really annoyed that it, 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 it's like, she always manages to do this. And this is a thing with abusive people. They will manage a grand gesture that impresses you and makes you think that they are, that they indeed do care about you and are going to make an effort. And they do that one thing. And then they like basically skate by on that for ages until you, you know, have the gall to say anything to them again, at which point they will accuse you of being maybe ungrateful or as his mother does with him, she accuses him of being really over emotional and dramatic and es essentially says like, I can't, you should have been born a girl considering how much you whine about your feelings. It's really annoying. Um, and he says something about how he's really tired and she says something like, oh, yeah, well, I bet that lording it over us addicts and alkies is really draining on, on, on you. Like, it's just astonishing to me how self-centered she is, that she really does think his addiction um, and his recovery is about her and an indictment on her somehow. And the fact that he wants to, like, take off, it's like she's simultaneously being really accusatory about that, like, oh, you want to get away from here. But at the same time, have, you're not making him feel welcome here or like his sobriety is anything that you respect. So his mother is just, she's not logical. She's just kind of a shitty person. And as much as she has flashes of like humor and, and protectiveness that I like and appreciate, most of the time she's just trash and it's hard for me to like watch him try to cope with her, you know? And finally he like goes down to his bedroom and he notices that the letters that he has been writing to his grandmother, his um maternal grandmother, they've been writing back and forth and there's some pretty heinous stuff because she's trying to get, a settlement from the school that like I talked about this in the last episode, his mother was writing to him after she got high on whatever that weirdness was and cleaned the house from top to bottom. And she wrote him a bunch of texts explaining how her mother was in an institution and basically experimented on. And that, you know, she's just talking to him about, what her mother went through and how she inherited inevitably some of that like OCD that her mother has now as a result of living in this like hospital environment. And after having been ill, like really seriously ill a couple of times, she likes to disinfect everything. And those illnesses were forced on her as experiments. But when he's writing back and forth with his grandma she tells him more about what was done to her and it's really hard for him to read. Like it's, he says that he has to sit with those letters a couple of times and like work up the nerve to read them because she's so matter of fact about how things went down. And that's something that I've mentioned about this author in general. Eden Robinson is very matter of fact about discussing abuse or violence in a way that's, so detached that it makes it that much more terrible. And these, they pierced her eardrum with a scalpel at one point because she kept on having like ear infections. And that was part of the, and she's talking about like being in the school and having to lay there and hear the other older girls being led out and screaming and screaming. 
which um, it's not expressly stated. And you could you could take that as them being experimented on. I believe they were being raped. This is something that indigenous women especially have had to endure to a degree that I don't think our minds are willing to comprehend, not even like able to, but we don't want to face it. If y'all look at the rate at which indigenous women are raped in comparison to the rest of the population and the rate at which they disappear and are not searched for, it is terrifying. And it's astonishing to me that we are about to enter fucking 2020. And the only improvements that we have made are to hide it more effectively. We aren't dealing with the problem. Last year, a man was found guilty of assaulting a native woman, holding her by the throat until she passed out while he masturbated on her. He was caught, confessed, she almost died. And he was able to walk away with no jail time at all. This woman nearly died and nobody cared. Nobody cared. It was one in a long line of examples and it got a lot of press at the time, but nothing I have, I have not heard of his sentence being changed or him having to go back to trial or her appealing or anything. Um, and it is just these stories. I feel like if you read this and you aren't educated in this sort of, um, history at all, and I'm not saying I'm particularly educated, I have a very ba basic knowledge. If you don't know anything about this and you were to read this book, I feel like the experience of his grandmother, you could look on as particularly horrific as being an outlier. It's not. It's not. Indigenous women who grew up on reservations or in systems all have stories like this. And like I has, like I said about like the incentive incentive incentivizing taking kids away from native parents, there is a whole new generation about to have stories of their own. This isn't over, you know. Nobody's fighting for these kids. Nobody with the resources because that's the main thing that oppressors depend on is they offer you the chance to get your child back through a system they dominate and they give you the illusion of having some sort of power, but they know the resources that it will require. And they are relying on the fact that you do not have access to those resources. You don't have the money to hire a lawyer. If you do, you don't have enough money to pay, like to see them and con like consult with them as much as you need to. And you get like one shot. You can afford one trial one hearing. And after that, if you don't get what you need, you're kind of out of money. And that will happen. I have more stories and I won't get into them right now, but stories about people at trial being literally like silenced and forced to sit down and not being able to speak when their child is the one that was taken. And they are not allowed to speak on their own behalf. And the judge won't even let them have a say and makes a ruling without them getting so much. Like they spend days working on a statement and they never get to say a word. 
it's just really and so jared's like feeling like he wants to hear this he wants to know what happened to her he wants to get closer to her but also kind of not wanting to know that's so understandable guy like he i feel like he sees it as a a form of respect that he forced himself to read it um but his mother takes these letters And comes at him in the middle of the night, the way that she does. She has torn them all to pieces and throws them in the air over him like confetti. And yells at him yet again for contacting somebody in the family that she doesn't want him to talk to. I understand why his mother doesn't like her ex or her mom. She talks about how, don't you remember when grandma tried to put a blood curse on you? Like, which, yes, you know, this is all reasonable shit. But his mother is so hell bent on holding a grudge. She won't let anybody redeem themselves. And she doesn't want to hear it that whether or not they are a perfect person. Jared hasn't got anybody. She keeps talking about how like, well, you have me and be loyal to me. Like she calls him really disloyal in the last book for helping out his dad. And it's such a disgusting because she really thinks that she is so worthy of unconditional loyalty by virtue of the fact that she provides him a basement to sleep in. She doesn't even provide him something to eat most of the time. He has to go and scrounge and figure out where he's getting his next meal. Every time that they eat together, she makes it clear that she doesn't want to be cooking for him or that providing him with this food is expensive. This is something that my dad used to do a little bit, and it always made me feel really shitty. This like reminder of how expensive it is to raise you. And do you know how much I'm spending? And I was not a kid that demanded expensive stuff. It was beaten into me pretty quickly in my life that we didn't have a lot of money. Even when we had more money than I thought, I didn't know it. And the constant reminder of how much it cost was just, it just felt like I didn't deserve to eat. You know, it was just like this a sort of insinuation that maybe you're not worth it. Can you like do something extra to like make it worth it for me to keep you fed and clothed, you know? Um, so his mother is doing, I was going to say bare minimum, but I really feel like it's less than bare minimum. And she's acting like she deserves all this credit for it. And it's so annoying. I just, uh So finally, and he gets, you know, she offers to drive him to the bus stop in the morning that he's going to go to, um, to head up to Vancouver. But after this, he doesn't want her to, understandably. He's just kind of like, you know, you know what, I'm out of here. And he hitches a ride with some guy and gets dropped off. And he's there like way early. The bus depot isn't open yet. The bus isn't due for like hours. So he decides to go and see his dad. And I keep, like, wanting so bad for his father to fucking be a father. But what happens is he goes and hangs out with his dad, has some coffee. And to be fair, there's pretty intense evidence all over the place that his dad is living in extreme poverty. He walks Jared out and he's wearing sneakers where the soles are like coming right off and flopping around. He has a windbreaker that's like so old that it's cracked and would definitely leak. This guy is not doing well. But the fact that he begs money off of Jared, I hate it so much. I'm so mad about it, guys. Like... He's acting like Jared's just holding out on him for the sake of it. You lied to him and you were 
squandering the money that you were getting and pretending that you didn't get the disability checks you were supposed to be getting. Like you played him and to have the unmitigated gall to come back and act like we're all friends here. That is some shit. That is really like, I, uh, and he was like, even $5 would be good. Cause he starts it off as like, you have enough money for your trip as if he cares about the kid. That's the part that makes me so angry. It's not just the, like the asking for money, but the way that he does it, where he tries to like frame the whole thing. Like he's so concerned about his son. And so it's, you got enough money for your trip and then it turns into got enough money for old dad. Bitch. No, he doesn't because you know what? You're about to drain him dry. You're like a fucking vampire. Everybody in Jared's life is genuinely like a vampire. Like they're all draining him of energy, of patience, of self-worth, of money, of effort. They're just fucking draining him like he's there for them. And it's so gross to watch. And on his way up, he's on Facebook. And I found this really interesting, like, because I feel like in the last book, there was a lot of mention of texting and stuff and YouTube even because that video got posted of him. But I don't feel like Facebook was mentioned quite as much. And it's talked about more in this episode and he uh, or these chapters and his mother posted a picture of like his dirty bed. And I don't remember exactly. And see, this is what I really want the actual paper copy in front of me so that I can like rem- like be reminded of exactly what went down here. But she posts a picture of it and says something about how like he uh, is still expecting her to change his diapers And I don't know if it's supposed to be that he pissed the bed or what, but I don't remember it being mentioned that he did. So I don't know if she like is making it sound that way so as to just humiliate him because she's mad at him still over writing to his grandma. But whatever the case, she goes out of her way to embarrass him on Facebook. And that combined with her tearing up the letters solidifies it for him later when he considers calling her about what's going on because David shows up and he, you know, thinks about it for like five minutes. Like maybe I should call mom and tell mom what's going on. But then he thinks about this post that she made and he's just like, no, you know what? Fuck her. I'm not doing this. And I really hope that he stands by that because I would, I would understand if he doesn't. It's a really long process to get shitty people out of your life. And it's even harder when it's family. And there's so many of us that like act like, okay, that's it. That's, that was the last straw and I'm done with this person. But the truth is you need like four of those moments to really say goodbye to a person who's been bad for you. Most of the time, it's not usually going to be enough. Just the one. So I'm hopeful that, being away from his mother, physically away from her, where she can't, like, be cute and make him mac and cheese and, like, joke around with him when he gets home. I'm hopeful that that is going to prove to be enough to keep him from forgiving her too easily. Because the thing about, and I understand that forgiveness, the whole point of it is supposed to be you letting go of anger. It's not for the other person. It's for you. However, I feel like he constantly forgives his mother when she has not apologized and doesn't see what she did wrong at all. She's, she still believes everything that she has been doing is valid. And for me, forgiveness of somebody who continues to do damaging, terrible shit to you and does not acknowledge that they fucked up. That's no longer forgiveness. That's just you enabling them being a bad person and allowing yourself to be walked on. That's a different animal. That's not forgiveness. That's you 
being a part of a pattern. So I have a really, I'm just hopeful that he doesn't turn around and head home. I hope that he goes for his aunts. I don't know if he knows where to find her or anything. And if he doesn't, I'm worried that he's not going to want to contact his mother to find out how to get in touch with his aunt because he's mad at her. Um, And I hope that that doesn't happen, that he doesn't hang on to his pride so much that he refuses to even accept that kind of help. Because that's necessary. Like, he needs some place to stay. He can't just be in this hostel the whole time. Hostels are cheap as fuck, but they're not free, you know? So, anyway. So, he heads up here. He go checks into this hostel. And um, he's been really serious about his sobriety to the point that, like, even as he's checking into this hostel, he's already thinking that he should go to another meeting. Which I think is a really, really good sign. Because a lot of people who are going to be sort of half-hearted about things will use excuse, like any sort of excuse they can to get out of doing it. So, you know, traveling and being in a new city, a lot of people would use that as an excuse to not go to a meeting because they're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm out of my routine and I don't know where a meeting is and I don't know anybody out here and I don't, you know, I'm not even like, ta- I'm not going to a bar or anything. Like, I don't need to worry about it. But Jared is smart enough to know that not only does he like need it, but there are people in his room later drinking and offering him a beer. It's not something that he can just get away from. And anybody who has gone sober knows this is true. It's a real struggle if you're trying to not drink to be social at all, because everything fucking revolves around booze. It's really like, it's an unfortunate truth. Um, And I was, I was not ready for like how in his face it was going to constantly be, but I appreciated that the author makes it clear because it's the truth of the matter. (laughs) So he goes to bed and he wakes up and who should be sitting right by his bed, but David, David, his mother's ex who broke his ribs and had a heart on while he did it because he was getting off on inflicting horrible pain on a child. And poor Jared is so exposed. Like he's got no shirt on and he had kicked off the sheet, I think while he was sleeping. So he doesn't even have that to sort of protect him. Um, even though it's an illusion of protection, it at least makes you feel a little bit more secure, you know? And this motherfucker, y'all, has the nerve, again, with the unmitigated gall, he has the absolute nerve to... Tell, I can't, like, I'm having trouble formulating this, these words because it's so insane to me. He insinuates that the nerve pain that he sustained from Jared's mother nail gunning his hands and feet to the floor is somehow Jared's fault. Now, did Jared's mother go a little hard? Yeah, she fucking sure did. Was she completely justified? 100,000%. It's not often that I completely back up his mother's violent streak, but a guy literally torturing your child, I will stand, stand, stand. Not a problem. Like, I'm so mad. The f- and he's whining, like, it's just, it's amazing to me that he can stand there and act like Jared is not, quote, taking responsibility. Wow. You were going to continue to torture this kid and maybe kill him. You're lucky, considering who his mother is, that you got out of there alive, buddy. She should have killed you. I kind of think that she wishes she did at this point. Maybe you will die by the end of this book. I hope so. 
Maybe just disappear, you know? I'd be happy with that if he just disappeared. Uh, and he finally leaves. And Jared is really shook. Uh, he tries to change rooms, but it turns out that, like, David had actually been checked into the room Jared was in. Somehow he made sure to be in the same room. And Jared's, like, sitting there trying to think, like, how did he know I was even coming out here? And how did he know what room I was in? And as he's, like, thinking about all of this, he just gets overwhelmed and he has to run to the bathroom and throw up. Because that's, like, the worst trauma of Jared's life. I think probably that outstrips him losing a toe to a bunch of river otters and getting it cauterized even. That is that losing a toe in that cave and everything is so surreal that I could see being able to detach from that mentally in a in a much quicker and more complete way than if you are trying to detach from something that happened in your own home in your bedroom, you know. So anyway, Jared is really fucked up over this. Um, so. Th- he like has his breakfast and all of this stuff at the hostel. He goes and he uh, meets up with Death Threat, who he's supposed to be staying with. And the whole thing that was supposed to be the deal between the two of them is that Death Threat was offering for him to have a room to stay in in exchange for him doing some small security stuff, which... I believe Jared expected to be like, we're going to have a room full of, of weed that people are like, you know, parceling out, or we're going to have to like, leave this stuff here to cook. And can you watch over it and make sure nobody comes in and just tries to take it like all that sort of thing. But it turns out when death threat shows up, he has changed the plan and he wants, um, He wants Jared to cook for him because he's trying to get into actually a like legal weed distribution scene. I say legal with like air quotes around it because he went to um, Washington and he went to Colorado and he says something about how it's not as robust in Washington that they're still like struggling with uh, a lot of the perceptions around it and having a lot of hangups, but Colorado really like is all in on legalizing. Um, And he says something like the future is edibles. And as somebody who cannot smoke due to asthma, I have to agree. (laughs) Edibles are just a a lot more accessible to uh, many people who aren't interested in smoking. The only thing is when you make them yourself, it's often kind of a crapshoot on how that's going to turn out, as I can tell you from experience. Um, So he wants Jared to bake. It's the cookie dude thing all over again. And Jared is like, okay, that wasn't the deal, though. And Death Threat says deals change. Things, plans change. And Jared's trying to be reasonable. And it's like, look, I'm sober here. I cannot be around that stuff all the time like that. I just can't do it. And he says, the fact that you're sober is what recommends you because I know that you're not going to be fucking stealing and trying to sample stuff. And Jared continues to argue like, dude, I know that the, I know why I am advantageous to you. This is not advantageous to me. I cannot. And finally, Death Threat starts to get in his face and is like, do you think you're going to live with me for fucking free? You're going to do what I tell you to do and punches him in the ribs. And Jared almost like keels over and he's able to kick Death Threat in the shin, tries to like knee him in the balls and misses. But he does manage to like put the guy down enough and be like I'm not fucking doing this with you and Death Red is finally like fine don't go fuck yourself enjoy being homeless and drives away and I gotta admit 
I'm worried about this because I don't know what kind of connection Jared has to this aunt that he could go and stay with. I want so bad for her to be a decent, balanced human being with a bright, sunshine-filled bedroom that Jared can come and crash in and she won't be up his ass about things. But I have a feeling that's not how this is going to go down because it doesn't seem like it's that kind of story. And I should mention, too, that his mother, being worried about him going off on his own, she knows that he's being hunted by these, like, river otters. Like, she killed most of them, maybe even all of them. But he still doesn't know how to protect himself. He's not adept at magic at all. So she's worried about how he's going to make it out there in the big bad world. Because as far as she's concerned, he's a baby. He doesn't know what he's doing. And she just sort of feels like you're taking an unnecessary risk when I'm pretty good at this and I can, you know, keep you protected here in the house. But he just doesn't seem to really think that the threat is real anymore. And if anything, the threat comes from her because like, like after she throws all of those uh, bits of the letter on him that she, you know, br like tore up she stands there and and starts to draw a curse at, like towards him and stands there and sort of holds it in her mind. And he's able to mind meld with her in a way that he never has before and see the fact that she could hurt him if she wanted. And she wants him to see that. And that is just such abusive shit. That's just a really shitty thing to do. And, like, when he wakes up in the morning and doesn't feel good, he can't help but think that maybe she did do something after all. That's a bad place to be, wondering if your mother fucking cursed you in your sleep. Like, Jesus, you know? Um, and speaking about magic in your sleep, he has a dream about Sarah, who, uh, she is still off in this, like, center for uh, women's wellness because of her suicide attempt um, or what we know was actually an attempt at like blood magic, but everybody else is seeing as a suicide attempt. Um, a, a combo suicide attempt with like uh, paranoid delusions or, you know, that kind of thing. And he has this dream that they're hanging out together. And the, I think that they're in his basement in this dream. It's almost like he feels like it's a memory. And she is dyeing her bangs. She's bleaching them in uh, just the bangs and then dyeing them blue with Kool-Aid. And then just like dancing around and joking and making her belly button talk and all this stuff. And he is kind of like when he wakes up, he kind of wants to contact her and he wants to hear from her again and he wants to see her again. But he just isn't so sure that that's like a good idea. So he winds up getting a text from her later. And she's like, hey, so I know this is pretty weird, but I definitely had a dream that we were hanging out together and it was super real. And he's like, oh, shit, because he feels that even though he doesn't have any personal magical talent to speak of, that for some reason, the two of them together managed to do something that they can't do by their, by themselves. And it's a combination of like, oh, shit, because he this is like something that he didn't know he could do. He doesn't know how to control it. You know, there's not really anything to be done about it now that he knows it's happening. But also being involved with magic was what led her to like cutting herself and he's concerned, I think, that her touching magic again at all could send her into another state where she's winding winds up hurting herself again. Um, and I wonder if Sarah's going to be another big part of this story or not, because we don't really get any details about how long she's supposed to be away, if this is longer than they expected or not. Mrs. Jax, um, he waits for her at the bus terminal, like after he gets off in Vancouver, because she has gone up here as well. 
So he's he let her know he was going to be here at this time, and he hoped that she would come and see him. But she's getting over her leukemia, and while she did manage to, like, beat it, she's pretty weak and tired, and, you know, she's old. And so she isn't there like he had hoped she would be when he gets off the bus, and he's a little bit disappointed by that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's about everything. I'm trying to remember if there's anything that I missed. Um, it's so, like I said, it's so hard to remember with the audiobook, but next week, or... I guess I have another episode on Friday, so hopefully the book will be here in time for Friday. Let me just look at my calendar real quick. Um, oh, no, I have until next week, Tuesday. So the book should definitely be here by then. Um, but, yeah, I feel like there's stuff that I'm definitely missing that I wanted to talk about. I'm just so hopeful for Jared because for a lot of people, getting out of their hometown is a big step in them beginning to get past some of the garbage that they internalized growing up. And it's not foolproof. Just leaving town is not enough to escape your own patterns and shit. But getting away from certain people is certainly really important. And I love that when he sees this post from her on Facebook, he decides to like go through his friends list and block anybody that is friends with her. It's not just him, like, unfriending her. It's him getting anyone who will maybe spy on him for her out of his feed. And I think that's huge. I think that was a smart move. Like, and I think it indicates that he's really serious about separating her from his life. Because it's really, really easy to just cut out the one person. But then sort of low-key, like passive aggressively rely on the fact that they're going to find out about what you're up to, or they're going to hear about what you posted from someone, even if it's not you, because you still have mutuals. And that's a really pernicious place to be when you are, you know, trying to like leave somebody behind, but you're still consciously thinking of them and, and what they would think of whatever you're writing or experiencing um, whatever photos you're posting. So the fact that he has decided that he's going to just like cut out anybody who could report back to his mom about his activities, it feels like that is a sign he means business. And I don't doubt she's going to notice and she's going to be pissed. But I think he's doing the right thing for himself. So I don't really know what to say about that. Um. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to wrap this up, but thank you very, very much again to Robin for commissioning this episode. Once again, my apologies for not having the print book, but I will next week. I promise. I am really excited to be back with Jared. I hope that he is able to pull this off with school and everything. We'll see. And I hope these damn river otters don't follow him into the city because that just seems ridiculous. I want to see how his magic is going to continue to manifest as well, because it keeps being said that he doesn't have any power. And I don't really buy it, but maybe he doesn't. And he even says like he like looked up online and found a list of other people who are claiming to be the child of Weget. And he says it like to himself that they just maybe they just want to feel exotic. And it's certainly, I'm sure, a good percentage of those people. But I wonder how many are for, for real and if he's actually going to get to meet any of them. Um, I'm very curious about that. So, all right, everybody. Well, thank you again so much for listening. Hope you've enjoyed this coverage. And I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.